In August of 2022, Wizards of the Coast announced in a video posted on YouTube that they would be releasing a new definitive version of Dungeons & Dragons in 2024, along with a 3D virtual tabletop. They called this whole venture 1D&D. The big thrust behind this new edition, which I'll call 6E, is a 3D virtual tabletop built with the latest Unreal Engine. In Watsi's video announcement, they really tried to emphasize how transformative this VTT will be to the experience of playing their game. And outside of the announcement, there were things like the infamous under-monetized meeting where top D&D execs, fresh from Microsoft's Xbox division, laid out a broad corporate strategy that presumably included microtransactions and subscriptions within this virtual tabletop. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here though. In this video, I want to share with you what I think are the seven reasons why Watsi's 3D virtual tabletop for 6E is going to fail. As always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments. Check out the true OSR now on Kickstarter. It's a parody OSR RPG where you can finally say, I win. GMs and players challenge each other in a duel to the death and only one will remain. The game is perfect for lighthearted one-shots and is designed to bring together old grumps who started with the red box and the newbies around the table. The true OSR has an easy to grasp system, perfect to be adapted to any other RPG. It's beautifully illustrated by Roberto Todorico, who takes all the classic RPG themes, horror, cyberpunk, fantasy, etc., and mixes them together in a bizarre and fun presentation. You'll find over 40 tables with thousands of elements that can be combined to generate new and unexpected combinations seasoned with simple rules. So how does the game actually work? Simple, there is no authority which the GM and PCs must scrupulously follow. Each question that a player makes to the GM generates a role on a corresponding table, and the GM doesn't have to invent anything. Instead, they insert the result of the role into the narration. You can download the free Quick Starter now, and if you like what you see, back the true OSR on Kickstarter today. The links are down in the description. Reason number one, hardware requirements. Highly visual VTTs shoulder the burden of everyone's imagination, but that means processing and rendering tons of assets and effects. That's hard on most computers unless they can make a cloud-based solution, which requires a good internet connection. I want to start by saying that I've tried a number of 3D VTTs on a variety of computers over the years. I'll cut to the chase here. It's a really mixed bag. The more 3D assets you want to render in a 3D space, the more system resources are required. The very best video game studios are able to optimize system resources and reduce CPU and memory usage so that games can run on weaker computers, but let's face it, there are always going to be people left behind in the world of computer gaming, which is what this will be, a computer game environment. So will Watsi's VTT be only for people who have newer computers? And will only people with dedicated graphic cards on gaming PCs be able to experience the VTT at its best? Again, they could go the route of doing all the graphical computing in the cloud, which is just another way of saying they will pay money to run computers at a remote facility that will then feed images to user computers. But that's pretty expensive to do and they'd have to charge more to use their VTT. That option also requires a pretty solid internet connection. In essence, funneling Dungeons & Dragons into a 3D VTT will require players to either have a decent computer strong and reliable internet connection, or probably both. Reason number two, hard on GMs trying to prep a few maps. In all my experiences with 3D virtual tabletops, I've spent hours and hours trying to prep a usable map. There is one instance recently, and I won't say who it was, but a 3D VTT developer was claiming on their Kickstarter that their game environment was going to be able to handle all kinds of fantasy scenarios. When I asked them to make a tavern that had a basement door that led to a dungeon, all based on assets I saw in their actual Kickstarter video, they said that was way beyond what they were able to do. Honestly, I don't blame them. Translating your ideas as a GM into rendered 3D environments is at best time consuming when you have all the right tools and at worst extremely difficult or impossible because your tool set is awkward and your assets are limited. And by assets, I mean renderable 3D objects you have at your disposal to place in the world. Walls, floors, traps, treasure chests, monsters, small objects. Compare this to a 2D VTT which uses image files to represent the world. If you've ever GM'd a game and used a VTT with 2D maps and character tokens, you'd know that even that method can take a lot of time. 
but that prep time pales in comparison to doing it in 3D. Dungeon Masters will realize this harsh reality in Watsi's tabletop app the moment they try to express their imagination outside the bounds of whatever limited starting assets they're given. Reason number three, software development isn't Watsi's or Hasbro's wheelhouse. Generally speaking, it's hard to make good software and you can't just throw money at it, even if we're talking about $150 million. It requires good project management at all levels. So the question is, with the six or more game development studios that the company has acquired and the five video games that they just announced that they're canceling, who is at the steering wheel here? Is it Chris Cow, the VP at Watsi who has only worked on MMORPGs and has allegedly never played D&D? The details on leadership are murky, but I'll say with confidence that if they didn't bring on an experienced framework of managers that can steer the software development cycle from beginning to end, we may literally not even see a launch of the VTT in 2024. If you look at Watsi's track record on delivering software, the picture is a pretty ugly one. Magic the Gathering programs have been notoriously buggy and outdated, the earliest versions of which would sometimes wipe out your entire hard drive, and the best of which still sport a dated interface. The VTT for 4th edition D&D failed before it ever even launched. Sword Coast Legends, the game that was meant to be the computer game cousin of 5th edition D&D at its launch, was taken off the market in a matter of months because it was notoriously bad. Just a couple years ago, a PC game licensed by Hasbro called Dark Alliance was hailed as possibly one of the worst D&D video games ever made. The best software that WotC has currently is its D&D Beyond website, which was bought in its entirety from another company and not developed in-house at all. Well-wishers of the corporation note that CEO Cynthia Williams, along with several other key executives, are veterans of the video game industry, but this does not a successful online marketplace and 3D virtual tabletop make. Management talent and experience needs to be found at all levels of a company in order for it to deliver complex software products on time and without fatal bugs and other problems. Reason number four, it would be like a video game, but you do all the work and have to buy maps and assets constantly. When you're a hammer, everything is a nail. And when you're CEO Cynthia Williams or VP Chris Cow, all games are video games that can host a quote, recurrent spending environment. But the fact is, not all games are video games. Tabletop role-playing games are not video games. There are pros and cons to both, obviously. One of the advantages of video games is that you don't have to assemble the worlds you're in or corral and manage the assets in the environment. That work is done for you. You just run around and interact with the environment and with other players, and new spaces are presented to you in spontaneous fashion. But if you're a dungeon master using Watsi's 3D tabletop, you're not just having to fiddle with every last bit in every last room, you're going to have to buy those little bits. It would be like nothing you've ever experienced before in tabletop role-playing. Instead of just saying to your players, yeah, there's a female chieftain goblin with elaborate headdress in this room, you will have to buy that special goblin beforehand. If, as the dungeon master, you hustle hard enough and spend enough money, maybe your players will get to have a video game-like experience, but you'll be the sweaty little puppeteer behind the scenes trying to keep all the assets on cue. This user experience cannot be sustained by dungeon masters in the long run, and without DMs, people won't play D&D on this platform. Reason number five, they won't get the complexity right. This is a really big one because it's just about impossible. You can't please everyone. If the app's interface is too easy to use with not enough options for a seasoned or imaginative dungeon master, people will leave the platform in droves. But if there are too many options and buttons and panels and drop-down menus, again, people will be repelled in massive numbers. There is a solution to this. Apple was one of the pioneers in a hybrid solution with their mobile phone and tablet operating system, OS X, where on the surface it's easy enough for a two-year-old to intuit, but just under the top layer, there's a ton of options and settings. But Apple makes it look easy. Most software companies can't pull this off because their developers and managers don't listen closely enough to their user experience engineers if they have any at all in the first place. This goes back to reason number three there with Hasbro not being a software company. If they acquired a really well-oiled and experienced development studio lock, stock, and barrel, they might have a fighting chance at landing on a genius level user interface that is at once intuitive, easy to learn, and rich with options just under the surface. But we're not talking about a cell phone interface here. A 3D virtual tabletop in some respects is much more complex. 
The user needs to be able to not only navigate a six axis virtual space, but view that space and shape that space with hundreds or thousands of assets in order to approximate an interactive fantasy themed environment. This is not unheard of, it's been done many times, but in my experience, it has yet to be done in a way that would be massively appealing to a large number of people in terms of user friendliness and intuitive design. They're probably not going to stick the landing on this, which means people won't use the software. Reason number six, WotC is cheap. You have to ask yourself, why is it that when you buy a $40 book from Free League, that it shows up with a beautiful matte cover, high quality cover stock and pages, unique layout approach, is always stitch bound and usually comes with ribbon bookmarks. But when you spend $40 on a WotC book, it's just this glue bound job with the same cover style and internal layout that they've been using for almost 10 years. That's called cheapness. A company of this size has economies of scale on their side. They can produce superior products at a far cheaper per unit price than Free League or anyone else on the market, but they don't because they're cheap. And if they're cheap with the books, the core products of D&D, then why wouldn't they cut corners with the virtual tabletop? Some of the corners they will cut with the software will only result in minor inconveniences or quirks, but a few of these shortcuts they take will have long lasting consequences in the life cycle of the program. Reason number seven, WotC is not to be trusted. In early 2023, a leak of an updated open game license or OGL signaled WotC was going to abandon 23 years worth of actual open game content creation and among other things, make it just about impossible for companies other than them to make D&D content for virtual tabletops. After a huge collective outcry from the RPG community, they issued a retraction on many of the greediest provisions in the new OGL, but they lied about it, claiming that it was always their intent to float a draft to creators for their input, when in fact it wasn't a draft. They were trying to get signed commitments from creators like Kickstarter on huge license fees and all kinds of prohibitively invasive provisions. They could have apologized and backtracked, but instead they committed to a bald-faced lie and added this cherry on top. And they couldn't stop lying. In a later mea culpa from executive Kyle Brink, they again referred to the leaked contract as a draft, even though it was being sent to creators for legally binding signatures. The litany of prevarications, misdirections, and outright lies actually goes on and on, but the topic has already been thoroughly covered in other channels. Here's the thing, no matter what their new game license looks like or what this company wants to do, how can third party content creators ever trust them again? And if they can't trust the company, then why would they make content for this virtual tabletop? What is a virtual tabletop without third party content creators? It's a recipe for desolation is what it is. Without a constant influx of content and instead almost total reliance on official first party releases of 3D assets, the whole platform will die on the vine. 3D assets are expensive and time consuming to make and really the only way to feed the kind of growth that a corporate entity and by extension eternally hungry shareholders demands is to crowdsource new assets. With a game license that they're developing, that crowdsourcing will be throttled to a trickle at best and the selection of 3D assets will become stale very quickly. And that's just the content creators who can't trust whatever creator's license they come up with. There's also the broken trust with the RPG player community at large. Yes, there will always be people flocking to brand name D&D for all the obvious reasons, but Watsi's mask slipped in early 2023 and a whole lot of people saw the company for what it really was. You could feel the waves of revelations happening as tens or maybe even hundreds of thousands of people all at once realized that this company is incredibly dishonest and holds the RPG community in the lowest regard. Those hordes of people will not be subscribing to the corporation's virtual tabletop when it launches or ever thereafter. So here's the thing. It will be costly for Watsi to operate this virtual tabletop, but they might actually see signs of a return on investment at launch. Over the course of a few months though, the bugs, the quirks, the shortcomings, and the general awkwardness of trying to play an open-ended story game in a close-ended video game style pay-to-play walled garden is going to drive user numbers down to the point that they will be losing money on the platform's operation. And at or around this point, they will bow to shareholder demands and shutter the whole thing. And the 6E VTT will just be another shameful blip in RPG history. But hey, I could be wrong. I'd love to hear your thoughts on any of the points I've made and whether or not you think this 3D VTT will succeed in the long run and what it could mean for the hobby at large. 
Thanks for watching. See ya.